Okay, uh, Jean-Michel is now going to talk to us about spoofing GPS. Okay, thanks for attending the presentation about uh, GPS spoofing. So actually, when I submitted the talk, I knew we could spoof GPS, but I didn't know whether we could detect GPS spoofing. So there is a, a sequel to the presentation, which is GPS spoofing detection. Uh, so that, that just worked on Monday, so it's quite fresh. So we're doing this work with uh, Gwen, who's over there. He's going to run the demo while I'm talking. Uh, and my colleague from the Besançon Observatory, we're doing this for fun, and actually we're being paid for doing this for fun. This is a project funded by the French National Research Agency, and that's a nice thing with university, you get paid to have fun, so that's what we're doing here. So just as a quick reminder, what is GPS? GPS uh, started as the NAFSTAR project, uh, of course DARPA project, started in 1973. S uh, satellites started launching in 1978. And I don't think there's been much uh, public exposure uh, as initially it was mostly a military service uh, until uh, Bill Clinton uh, removed selective availability or decided to have selective availability removed in uh, 2000. And then the resolution dropped from 45 meters more or less to sub five meters. And then your GPS becomes usable. So I think this is when uh, GPS has become ubiquitous to most of our daily activities from getting to the right place to uh, geolocating uh, multiple activities on our mobile phones. Uh, the basic principle, and this will be the core topic of my, uh, the, the, the core uh, uh, discussion of, of my presentation, is that GPS is basically a set of space-borne atomic clocks that generate high stability uh, reference signal. If you were here in 2015, I presented how to uh, synchronize oscillators and how to use uh, data from, from uh, GPS to, to uh, uh, collect uh, using SDR the, the GPS signals. And you use triliteration, which is, means you look at the time of flight of the signal from all these satellites in space, and by uh, looking at the intersection of a hyperbola, you end up finding where you're located on the Earth. Now, this was uh, all pretty fancy for the common public until software-defined radio grew uh, impressively. And not only can you now receive data uh, signals, but you can also synthesize signals. So we're going to run the demo on the Pluto SDR. And nowadays, GPS spoofing has become a sub-100 euro activity. Of course, jamming has no interest. I mean, jamming is just sending a powerful signal. Spoofing is much more uh, interesting. So why are we paid to work on this? Uh, it's not the most attractive reason, but that's actually the people who are paying for it. Um, one of the reasons people are interested in, in using GPS is how do you synchronize uh, clocks located at different places in space. Uh, one of the people who are interested in this is traders. When you have trading uh, centers, where did you buy the share first? Is it in New York, in Frankfurt, or in Paris? These people, they want to know accurately the timing of their transactions. So if you look at this paper here, it's from the New York Times, so it's a general public journal, you can trust or not trust the content, but uh, if you, it, it just uh, uh, illustrates why we're working on this. Uh, there is a new regulation that says that all uh, trade financial institutions must synchronize timestamp trades with microsecond accuracy. Now remember, light travels 300 meters per microsecond. Uh, Frankfurt is more than 300 meters from Paris, so how do you synchronize two clocks in Paris and in Frankfurt when they are more than 300 meters away? And well, what we say here is Google would later use this method to synchronize computer based on GPS data. Thank you, Google. Uh, so people have been doing this for like 20, 30 years now. But uh, GPS is accepted as one of the usual means of synchronizing uh, spatially distributed data. So my talk here is, can you trust the time that you distribute with, with GPS? Um, so just as a quick very brief summary of, of what GPS looks like. GPS is actually a constellation of satellites, so atomic clocks, uh, rubidium clocks, and hydrogen maser uh, embedded on, on space vehicles. And these atomic clocks send a code at one megabit per second, uh, which you receive on, uh, on, on, on ground. And uh, by using, by, by calculating um, the solar range, solar range defined as the time it took for a signal to go from satellite J down to ground divided by C, velocity of light, you get uh, estimates of, by triliteration, of the position of, of when you're on the ground. Now, this, you're used to doing this real time, but most professional users will be post-processing their GPS data because these space vehicle positions 
are estimated when you send the navigation data from the satellite, they estimate for the next day where the satellite should be. Of course, estimations has some error. And if you go for submeter positioning, which is what you do for geodetic analysis or for geophysical measurements, well, you need to get uh, better accuracy. Imagine you want to be located on the ground with submeter resolution. It means you need to know where your space vehicle is with submeter resolution. And this you usually do with post processing. So, what you can find on the internet is a set of files that will not only give you the estimates of a satellite in the future, but also the past measurements. These are called, or the format for sharing this data are the Renex files. These will be uh, our input data. We will be able to spoof GPS by using the Renex files uh, and generate uh, a, a virtual constellation of data based on, on, on this data. Um, so you get these Renex files of the observation of the navigation data of, of, of the satellites, and by doing this, you can collect uh, uh, where the satellite should be. Uh, so what will be our spoofing technique? Spoofing technique will be the uh, Pluto SDR. Uh, GPS is one megabit per second, so you need a two megahertz bandwidth. Pluto SDR has more than two megahertz bandwidth, so perfect, we can generate the data on the Pluto SDR. We did try to uh, embed uh, the software that we're using, which is the excellent software here, Pluto GPS Sim, uh, on the zinc of a Pluto SDR. I think either this software was not optimized enough because it's very readable, but if it's readable, it's not necessarily very optimized. Um, so we did try to embed the software on the zinc. Uh, you'd get uh, this continuous data stream. So you still need, at the moment, we still need to run this on the PC and to uh, stream the IQ coefficients to the Pluto SDR, which is what Gwen is doing at the moment. Um, and actually, if you, as I'm talking, if you want to check on your mobile phone, it could be that you're somewhere in the in the in the uh, sea at the moment. Um, so. We are uh, streaming this data, and uh, you see here the spectrum. So you start with uh, so if you have a starting point of zero dBm, I just did quick little calculation to estimate the range of the attack. Of course, I don't want to move all of Brussels into the sea now. I just want to move this room into the sea. So if you do a quick calculation here, the standard of GPS, the definition of GPS published by the U.S. Air Force, states that on a receiver you should have something like minus 132 dBm. <laughs> Let's take a 6 dB. Uh, uh, safety range. So it means that if we transmit minus 30 dBm, because the Pluto SDR is designed to power 0 dBm, we check this on the carrier, and because you spread the spectrum uh, over uh, 1 megahertz per second, you drop 30 dB. So that's just your spectrum spreading uh, over, uh, over 1 megahertz. And because we're, sp we're spreading the spectrum, we have a transmitted power of minus 30 dBm. Uh, free space propagation loss at 1.57 gigahertz is this equation. And if you do the maths, you end up finding that if you emit 0 dBm, your range, uh, of your, your spoofing range is 800 meters. Just to give you a range, you're not going to attack a whole country by doing this. You're just going to attack a uh, local area. Here we're powering with minus 20 dBm, so we drop the power. We have a range, a free space range, about 80 meters. This we checked on our parking lot. It matches. We were more or less at 50 meters when we, when we attacked. So just to tell you that we try to be knowledgeable about what we're doing here, we're not just uh, uh, sending power everywhere. Okay, so may some, some of you might. Has anyone been spoofed in the room? Yeah, good. Wow, it's working very well, good. So you see here that. Uh, uh, so we moved most, most of you in the sea. Uh, so what Gwen did just before coming here, he collected on the internet the current Renex file that gives you, the, in the last hour, the uh, measured position of a, a satellite. Uh, and in, your, in this case, this is what we did in the lab. You see here one Samsung mobile phone that was not spoofed. It was still in Besançon, east of France, 47 degree north. And in this example, this was south of France, uh, 42 degree north. So two of my mobile phones, one Sony, one Samsung, were south of France. One was staying in Besançon. Good, that works. Well, that works most of the time. It works very well with mobile phones, and as, as I can see, all these hands raised in the room. Um, however, does it work on UAVs? So all these little, little drones that, uh, that, you're, that you're buying for a few hundred euros. So on uh, DJI drones, you have these U-Blocks uh, receivers. U-Blocks is a, a Swiss company selling, I would say, high-grade, uh, low-cost uh, GPS receivers. And the nice thing with U-Blocks is when you're looking on your mobile phone, well, you get spoofed, but you don't know what happened. What is the quantity that might have protected the spoofing? What's nice with the U-blocks is that you got the raw data. So U-blocks will give you uh, the total range, they will give you the Doppler shift, and they will give you some indicator, spoofing and jamming indicator. 
So you run this in the proprietary uh, uBlock Center software, which runs on the Wine. And if you have uh, an accurate source, so what we did here is the, the clock that's provided with the Pluto SDR is a 40 megahertz uh, temperature, temperature compensated crystal oscillator. I'll show you a bit later that it can be off by a few ppm. So uh, an atomic clock will never be off by a few ppm, by a few ppb at most, part per billion. So what we did here is we removed the, the quartz uh, from the uh, Pluto SDR and we fed it with a hydrogen maser, so basically a very high stability clock. And if you see here that we clock the Pluto SDR with a hydrogen maser controlled source, well, we get nice Doppler shifts. Uh, if you do the calculation, if you do the maths, you will find out that due to the uh, orbit of a GP, GPS satellite, uh, you define the period, 12 hours. And if you know the velocity of uh, the satellite, which is the uh, radius of, of, sorry, the circumference of its orbit divided by the time, and you do the uh, Doppler shift uh, conversion from velocity to Doppler, you find that GPS can never be offset by more than plus or minus five kilohertz. And here it matches two kilohertz, three kilohertz, minus one kilohertz. So you see all green with spoofed U-Blox uh, receivers. However, if we offset on purpose by 200 hertz our 40 megahertz uh, synthesizer, you see that the Dopplers become unrealistic. We have 10 kilohertz. Physically, it's impossible to have a GPS offset by 10 kilohertz. So indeed, the uh, U-Blox has identified that some of these uh, satellite signals are not genuine because there is a spoofing indicator well, maybe it's my mistake not to have activated all the security facilities of, of the U-Blocks, but at least this one was still giving us position, the wrong position. It knew it was wrong, but it was still giving the position. So what can we do to improve this? Well, not everyone has a hydrogen maser at home, and uh, we wanted to spoof cars, and cars were resistant. So I believe that cars do have this kind of spoofing uh, capability protection. So what we wanted to do here is to try to, well, first of all, we, try, we, we tested that indeed the reason why car were not easily spoofed was because of our excessive frequency offset between uh, local oscillator and expected oscillator. So we did the attack with our hydrogen maser controlled uh, local oscillator and indeed the car located in Besançon, east of France, had their wheels in the sea uh, somewhere near Brittany. So that worked. So it, it, indeed the problem is local oscillator. So you might have seen me setting up a, a temperature controlled crystal oscillator, so that's an OCXO. OCXO, you can buy them for 100 euro uh, on, the, on, on eBay. This particular one was uh, salvaged from a broken uh, frequency counter. Uh, so you go at your university, you look at the trash, you find all frequency counters, Hewlett-Packard frequency counter. Hewlett-Packard is obviously the best uh, oscillator manufacturer. So you get one of these old uh, synthesizers, you take the OCXO off, and you see here it's a 25, 24 volt, uh, 500 milliamp uh, oven uh, voltage supply and 12 volt negligible current to run the oscillator. So basically this runs on battery and it means you have a, a mobile attack. You don't need to stay in the lab uh, as, as I'm demonstrating here. So what is the consequence actually, because I'm coming from a laboratory dedicated to time and frequency. So what is the consequence of, of replacing the, of the crystal oscillator? What is the consequence? Just to introduce to you a little bit and, and then I will go to the detection. Um, so what is the consequence of, uh, uh, of, of replacing the oscillator? I'm putting this graph here because I haven't seen these on any of analog devices data sheet or any information. So this is uh, the stability of a temperature control crystal oscillator. So you see here, for three days, the crystal oscillator was running. We, you are sold a 40 megahertz oscillator, but a crystal oscillator, a temperature compensator crystal oscillator, is only passively compensated, meaning if the room temperature changes, well, it will shift, shift a little bit. You see here, it's moving by plus or minus 10 hertz. It might not sound much, 10 hertz over 40 megahertz is not, uh, not much, well, that's about uh, eight, uh, five, 10 to the minus eight. That's awful for an oscillator. I mean, for a clock, uh, we, if you say that GPS is made of atomic clocks, that's infinite. So what we did here is replace it with the OCXO, which is a blue line here. Since you have a one pixel wide blue line, what I did is I magnified the blue line into this one here. Notice that there is a thousand fold scale increase from this scale for the TCXO to the OCXO. So what we did, by replacing the TCXO with the OCXO, the, temp the temperature control with the oven control crystal oscillator, is we improved four order of magnitude of stability. Um, so you see here, we go from about few 10 to the minus eight to few 10 to the minus 13. That's a very good uh, uh, Hewlett-Packard oscillator. And that explains to you why now it's working. 
However, there is a trade-off. This is the long-term stability, but there is another parameter that we are very much obsessed in, especially for radar application, and that's short-term stability. So when you think of short-term, sub-second stability, you generally don't think about time, but frequency, the inverse of time. So if you look at phase noise, phase noise is how much your oscillator fluctuates in a given, well, rate, which is inverse of time. And what I find interesting is that this is the curve. The black curve here is the on onboard Racon 40 megahertz TCXO provided by uh, analog devices. And you see that on the, on the long, uh, sorry, on the short term, so large frequency, large offset, offset frequency, <coughs> we have excellent stability. They really choose a very good oscillator. However, well, it's only a TCXO, so when you go at, at longer durations, so frequency closer to the carrier, that's uh, 10 milliseconds, 100 milliseconds, one second from the carrier, you see that, of course, it diverges. Well, it's a TCXO, it moves with temperature. With the OCXO, we've solved the problem, but what you see here is that if you, so the, the Pluto SDR you can find on the analog website, you, can, you don't need to to clock it 40 megahertz, and actually most OCXO will be 10 megahertz, the standard is 10 megahertz. So what I did here is I, I configured, or we configured with Gwen, uh, the, the, the local oscillator to be 10, 20, 30, 40 megahertz, and what you see actually is that the PLL of the Pluto SDR is really not working very well at 10 megahertz. At 10 megahertz you have, this is the, the, a very good clock, but still the, the PLL internal to the, to the Pluto SDR exhibits a high phase noise. 20 megahertz is a bit better, and only above 30 megahertz can you get the, the expected phase noise quality. So what would, be have, what would have been nice is to take the OCXO, clock a DDS to generate the 40 megahertz, and feed the Pluto SDR with the 40 megahertz locked on the OCXO. We didn't have time to do this. So just to introduce to you what is the why it has, does it have a consequence? Now, if you think this is 10 dB, what is 10 dB? Why does the Pluto SDR care about 10 dB? Remember that all this yellow vest movement in France, where this, you've got all these strikes and riots, it's a 0.8 dB rise in uh, oil price, in, in gasoline price. So imagine how unhappy the Pluto SDR is when it sees its local... <laughs> and I trust the time that is uh, transmitted between trade centers using GPS. Now, my colleague, Francois Meyer, tells me never, ever tune a, an, an atomic clock. An atomic clock might drift a little bit due to aging, due to pressure change, due to environmental change, but it's very deterministic uh, changes. So you never ever tune an anatomy clock. You measure the drift, and when you measure the drift, you inform the user of this drift, but you don't try tuning the atomic clock. So this is exactly what's done on GPS. On GPS, the time offset between the onboard uh, atomic clocks and the ground atomic clocks uh, at the USNO are measured and we don't tune the oscillators above the satellite, we just inform the user of frequency offset, linear drift, and my colleague Francois tells me that a quadratic offset is actually always to zero. So this is actually what you find in the software, on, on the spoofing software, you see indeed that the clock is AF0 plus time times AF1 plus times times times, so times square times AF2 plus the relativistic uh, correction plus uh, the group delay, so between frequency one and frequency two, uh, the two carriers of GPS. So indeed, and you have a first derivative here. So you see that indeed AF0, AF1, AF2 determine the time. And what you can do here is you send this time in the frames of the navigation, uh, navigation frames of, of your GPS signal. So what Gwen did here is, so what Gwen is going uh, to jail and not me. Um, so what you see here is um, what we did is we introduced 5, 10 to the minus 6, so 5 microseconds in the AF0 offset here. And indeed, when you measure the 1 PPS output of your U-block GPS, you see that every two minutes, time is shifted by 5 microseconds. So you can spoof time using this. Now, the question was, if you spoof time, do you move in space? Well, no, because the whole constellation is jumping over time. So it means that the relative position of the satellites are still the same. It's just the time that has shifted. So if you look at the position that was sent by the U-blocks, we haven't moved. If you move by 10 microseconds, you expect to move by 3 kilometers, which is obviously not the case. You see that there is a little bit of jump here, but we obviously did not move by the time introduced by the jump of, 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 uh, of, of the time offset. So that demonstrates to you that, well, I wouldn't say it's an easy attack. I don't think it's a, a representative attack in real life, but I just wanted to make you think about, is such information reliable? 
it's been a long time that DARPA is no longer relying on GPS. Now they, they have their own ground-based uh, locating system. But for civilian use, this has huge... It's your fault. <laughs> so um, it does have implications, in my opinion, about the trust we can have in GPS. Now, uh, and this is where I have to... Okay. So... Um, now I would like to imagine what can I do to detect spoofing. Again, jamming is, is stupid. I mean, you take a spectrum analyzer, you, do, you look at, at your spectrum and you see jamming. That, that's easy enough. How can you protect from spoofing? We've seen that there is a Doppler. Well, Doppler, if you have a good enough local oscillator, you can simulate Doppler. There is power. Well, power is, again, you can tune power so that the, your receiver believes that you're in the right power range. So I wouldn't consider these anti-spoofing techniques as reliable because you can adapt, uh, someone powerful enough can adapt power, can adapt frequency. I think that there is one quantity that cannot be spoofed, and it's the fact that GPS is a constellation of satellites all over the sky. Due to spoofing attack, with all the spoofing uh, antennas synchronized to sub-microsecond, which is the whole topic that we're discussing here. So, in my opinion, looking at the angle of arrival of a signal is, I cannot imagine, of, of, how, of a way of, 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 uh, of uh, countering this kind of, of detection. And, of course, if you look at uh, proceeding of IEEE, a uh, special issue in 2016 about uh, GNSS sensitivity to attacks, you see that quite a few authors were interested in multi-antenna arrays and detecting angle of arrival. So I will not go into the maths. Uh, I'm running a bit out of time. But just imagine that if you have a source which is very far away, these are the conditions of far away, GPS is more than six meters away from the receiver, the GPS satellites, so far field conditions are met. And then you have between multiple antenna, a phase offset which is only dependent on azimuth and elevation of your, of your antenna. And this is an example of this paper here, which is cited in this paper, where the offers, you, you might have seen this, it was a yacht, uh, uh, they were trying to simulate how you could take a yacht in a, in a, in a wrong position, so they, they spoof their GPS from uh, one constellation, which is a genuine constellation, and they move the yacht in the wrong place, which is just what we did a few minutes ago. And what these offers say, say, look at the phase between antennas, they have all collapsed in one value, of course, because your emitter is located in one place. The power has jumped, that's just because they didn't tune their power well enough, and the Doppler shift has, uh, has, uh, uh, has changed shape. Well, that's just because they don't have a good local oscillator. But in my opinion, this is really the, the important part. Now, the problem for me is when I read the paper, I just don't understand anything about what they did. I mean, it's, it, they demonstrated, but they go into tuning their, their PLL that locks on the, on the, local, on the phase uh, copy on the DLL. I just cannot understand. So what I would to, like to show you, thanks to Paul Boven's presentation, so the next presenter's presentation in 2013, is what well, I think I devised a very simple means of, of uh, detecting uh, and a very computationally efficient way of doing this. Now, what I'm demonstrating here is a B210. The B210 here is connected through BIOS T to two GPS antennas. You see the two GPS antenna on the top floor of our laboratory. Uh, here, the B210 is collecting the two data stream. So you, I'm just saving on the computer all the, all the IQ coefficients. Now, your usual way of, of detecting GPS is to say, let's plot the Doppler shift for each cell, uh, satellite. We cross-correlate the goal code for each Doppler shift, Doppler offset. And if there is the right Doppler offset, you see a little peak in the cross-correlation, which tells you this satellite is visible. That's the acquisition phase of, of GPS. And this is on both antennas. So both antennas are seeing the same satellites. Good, they're facing the same place. Now, what Paul told us in 2013 is that your GPS signal is proportional, there's a magnitude we don't care about, it's, called, it's proportional to the Doppler shift, the BPSK phase spectrum spreading, and the geometrical phase between the two antennas. Now, the problem, the challenge that was demonstrated by Paul is that, or shown by Paul, is that because of spectrum spreading, your GPS signal is below thermal noise level. At, at, at room temperature, your thermal noise on the, on the bandwidth of 2 megahertz is minus 111 dBm, and your GPS signal by the standard is around minus 130 dBm. So you cannot detect GPS just by looking at a spectrum analyzer unless you have the fine radio telescope that he's going to talk to us about. Now, what Paul told us is, if you want to get rid of the BPSK to collapse the spectrum, 
all you need to do is to square the signal because by squaring the signal, BPSK is zero pi phase. So if you square the signal, you double the argument. And by doubling the argument, you have zero or two pi and two pi equals zero. So you collapse the spectrum. And all this energy that is spread over two megahertz is now concentrated in one peak that has raised by 30 dB. If you raise by 30 dB a signal that is better than minus 130 dBm, you go above a minus 111 dB and you can see your signal. And surely enough, if you do this, you get your peaks here with a frequency offset which is given by delta omega, the uh, frequency shift. You've removed the BPSK uh, modulation and you're only left the, with a geometrical phase. Is this true? Well, if I now look at this flow graph where I do this uh, just to save space, uh, I, I run the file source or the USRP source, I run this in the multiply to square the data. Once I've squared the data, I've collapsed the spectrum and I can just uh, plot this. So this is live, live measurements on a, on a B210, so you see all your satellites here. And surely enough, if I plot the phases of the spoofing signal, so you see this is quite recent, this was 30th of, of January. So the spoofing signal, all the phases of all the satellites, each column here is a different satellite, they're all the same. That's not possible. All the satellites cannot be located the same place. Now there is a bit of a question that I might want to discuss with the guys of ITERS because I, I'm not really clear why the phase has changed from one acquisition to another. But if you look inside one data set, if I, so these are 10 second measurements. If I look from various chunks of data, you have always the same phase. Somehow when I stopped the Pluto and I restarted five minutes later, it was a bit offset. I don't yet exactly know why. And if you look at the genuine GPS constellation, all your satellites will exhibit different phases. So meaning all the satellites are at different locations. So you see you have a very efficient, computationally efficient solution because you just have to square your signal, look at the phase at the abscissa of each one of your peaks, and you get uh, the phase of, of your signal. So as a conclusion, I want to show you that spoofing GPS is a good opportunity to demonstrate detailed understanding of, of GPS signals. It's really easy to implement on, on the Pluto SDR, as you can see here on the desk. A B210 SDR can allow you to detect. I don't claim to be doing a full GPS receiver as the guy from GNSS SDR are doing in Barcelona. I just claim to be very, running a very stupid script, very computationally efficient script on the B210 to measure direction of arrival and detect where, uh, uh, fr where from the signal is coming from. And so I consider this as a good dual approach. Either you can have the full GNSS SDR running on the B210 or, uh, on the IQ coefficients, or to have a real GPS receiver and my little approach here to, 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 to detect spoofing. If you want to see a promotional video about what real people can do about spoofing GPS, if you think this is just a toy and you have 40k K euro to, to spare, you can see what Roland Schwarz is doing and they will spoof any signal that you want. So I, what I'm thinking here, if you have enough money, what I'm showing here is realistic. And for the French speaking audience, all this is detailed in the current MISC issue, whose article is translated on the FOSDEM webpage. So for English speaking audience, the article that's in there has been translated for you in, uh, to, to, to English. So you can, you can have a look at, at, at these documents. And with that, I thank you for your attention.